Yes, hi everyone, and a warm welcome to today's seminar, which is organized by Save the Children in Sweden. And my name is Oskar Kolberg, and I will lead this talk, and I have the great privilege to talk to Jolan Wright, who is the Global Director for Climate at Save the Children, and Jon Berjo, the Policy Advisor at Save the Children in Sweden. And uh, we also have Asia Yaub, student and climate activist from Pakistan. It's been a bit uh, hard to get... Um, uh, connect from Pakistan, but we hope you are online now uh, soon, Asia. Uh, but she doesn't seem to be in, uh, in the call at the moment, but we are waiting for you. And if you are looking on this on uh, Facebook, please feel free to post comments and questions that you might have in the chat box, and we will uh, reply there afterwards. And uh, children being born today will grow up in a a uh, dramatically different world from their parents and their grandparents. And globally, around one billion children, there's nearly half of the world's children, live in uh, countries that are at an extreme high risk from the impacts of climate change, according to the Children's Climate Risk Index from UNICEF. And the Convention of the Rights of the Child applies to all children everywhere, yet the climate crisis is harming the children most affected by inequalities and discrimination first and worst. And so the first question will go to you, Yolande. Uh, in what way would you say that the climate crisis is a child rights crisis? Thank you. Hi. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? We hear you fine. Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, well, Save the Children feels that the climate crisis is a huge child rights crisis because fundamentally it risks undermining a huge range of children's fundamental rights that almost every country in the world have signed up to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We've also committed to things like the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we were committed to an e uh, ending extreme poverty, hunger, you know, ensuring that children have the right to education, health, um, freedom of expression, a healthy environment, and all of those things are under threat from the climate crisis. Um, what we're seeing is that many people used to speak about the climate crisis as a future event protecting our grandchildren. Actually, what we're seeing is the climate crisis is already affecting children right now. We know it will get worse as time goes on, uh, but we are already seeing children right now all around the world affected very directly. Um, so there are a number of droughts, for example, right now that we know are, are more frequent and more extreme as a result of climate change. And we're seeing children, you know, more than um, five million children under five right now at the brink of famine. Many of those are linked to climate crisis events. I mean, obviously, there are other things going on in the world right now affecting things like hunger, uh, COVID crisis, conflict. But what we're seeing is the climate crisis is a threat multiplier and it is adding um, to existing inequalities. It's affecting the poorest and the most marginalized children the worst and the most. Um, but it's actually affecting children everywhere. So uh, children from Portugal, uh, right the way to children from Kenya are, are feeling the effects and, and um, rightly standing up for their rights. But we are already really concerned that despite the incredible movements of children around the world, they, there isn't still enough urgency of action. And we know that if we don't limit warming to the promise of, of maximum 1.5 degrees, many, many more children's rights will be under threat. Mm. And um, could you give us some examples like uh, how the climate crisis is affecting children more directly if you have like some snapshots from, from around the world? Of course. So I hope Aisha will be able to join us shortly from Pakistan, um, where we know that there have been an, a number of extreme events such as uh, floods which have affected um people's homes, people's schools. Even right now in Burundi, um, there's an extraordinary um, flood event. The lake has, has uh, gone extremely outside of its normal bounds and schools, houses, homes are being uh, flooded. That means that obviously people's homes are, uh, are uh, damaged and may not be suitable to go back to live in, but also schooling is interrupted. And we We've seen globally when schooling is interrupted, we've seen this with COVID, so hopefully it's really in people's minds. When schooling is interrupted, it affects poorest and more marginalized children the most because they may not have access 
to ways of continuing their learning out of school. They may not have access to mobile phones or other devices that they can connect to the internet and, and receive educational material. And the other thing we've seen is when schools reopen after an extreme event, or just like after COVID, many children don't go back and it's often for economic reasons and it's often girls. So we saw after the extreme cyclones that affected Mozambique two in a row um, that again were, uh, were linked to climate change. The, the children who were uh, most likely not to return to school were adolescent girls. That, that was because um, of risk of things like early marriage when families are under financial pressure when they're um, displaced, they're very worried about the safety, security of their girls, especially as they get older. And they often see marriage as, as the best uh, option for their children. But as you know, early forced or child marriage can really change a child's life outcomes dramatically. And, um, you know, we're fighting to try and give every child the right to continue their education uh, right up to their 18th birthday, at least. So um, we've seen those educational impacts happening as a result of climate change after cyclones in, in Asia, in Africa. We've seen the disruption to education after floods uh, all over the world. And as I mentioned earlier, also the drought, the increasing uh, numbers of droughts and crop failures uh, linked to the climate crisis are meaning we've seen a really alarming rise in child hunger, not just in one or two countries, but in more than 15 countries around the world now, there is a serious uh, hunger crisis that may not be hitting the headlines, but we're really working hard to try and you know, uh, provide nutrition and health support to those children because there's really a growing number in a very dire situation already now. And if we don't take action, we could be moving into a situation where there's almost continuous ongoing humanitarian crises. Um, and we need to try and avoid that situation. Yeah, sure. Thank you. And um, unfortunately, we still don't have Asia with us. Uh, she, we this we will have a, we have another 20 minutes hopefully she can join in the end at least it would be um, a shame otherwise because asia is a young uh, climate activist from pakistan who's been uh, engaging um, young people around pakistan and she has been also very involved in forming a youth movement uh, on in the rural areas in pakistan so hopefully we'll, we'll uh, she can join us soon, but then I jump to you, Jon, instead. Uh, you work with ad advocacy and policy at Save the Children Sweden. And what has the climate crisis meant for the work with, that we are doing in Sweden? Why is this important for Save the Children? I think, f first, um, the climate crisis has meant that we have to, we have to update and, and the, way, the way we talk about the world, the way we understand the world, because climate crisis is, is, is overshadowing and it's affecting every other issue that we work with. And it's, as Yolanda has made very clear, it's, it's so obvious now that, that, we, we have, that this is a child rights crisis. And for us as a child rights organization, that means now that we also, it's not enough as we might be more sort of comfortable uh, of, of doing, supporting children's participation, supporting children's organizations, supporting uh, children's mobilizations. But now, listening to these children, what they say to us is that you have to support our specific demands to create a society free from fossil fuels. And that, as a child rights organization, is a bit new. So we have to think think hard about how we can contribute in the best way. But it means collaborating more with, with environmental organizations in Sweden, globally also. Uh, it means new, new expertise in our organization. Yeah. And um, it's been very much uh, the work f of Asia and other young climate activists, and numerous, there are millions actually, that have put this question on top of the political agenda around the world. It started three years ago with Greta Thunberg and it's just been all over the world since. So uh, someone might ask, like, what took save so long to, to join this movement? Uh, Yolande or Jun, any one of you want to answer that? Sure, and I think I see Asia may have joined us, so um, hopefully if she can hear, she can um, join in afterwards. And I think 
the fact that she's having difficulty joining is a perfect illustration of how um, making sure that the voice of children, not only from uh, wealthier countries and, and privileged backgrounds, but from all around the world get a chance. Um, and it is obviously much more difficult for a number of reasons. Um, what took SAVE so long? I think um, SAVE is absolutely fundamentally a child rights organization. And we have actually been working on the climate crisis for, for many years, we've had a very strong emphasis on disaster risk reduction. More than 50% of our work has been in fragile uh, contexts and humanitarian work. So we've seen for a long time this slow increase in the number of extreme events that we're responding to. And we've been doing things like, we've got a safe schools common approach, which is looking at how to make sure that schools that are built uh, for children are safe, that they are risk uh, you know, risk informed that they can withstand extreme events. Um, we have been working in Bangladesh, for example, in the north with communities that are very flood prone for a number of years on on a project called Shachana, which is doing agricultural interventions that are trying to adapt to more increased flooding risks in that part of, of Bangladesh. So we have been working on on this, but I think um, it probably has been the children's movements that have really made us realize how strongly we ought to be stepping up in this area to support children from all over the world that are demanding that we prioritize this and actually in our next strategy our child panel has very strongly pushed us to put climate front and center of our next strategy period so we have listened and learned from children and we have raised this up the agenda but we have been working on this issue for a while mm. And you were saying, yeah, you both talk about supporting children. So what could that mean? Uh, in, in what way could we, as an organization, help to amplify these wo voices further? Jon? Yeah, I, for Save the Children, it has always been sort of an, an important part of, of, of supporting children's participation and supporting children's uh, organization. Um, now, when we do that, they, they push us like, OK, so now what, what the support we want is that you support our demands. Mm. Um, so, so I think that's for us sort of the next step where we how, how can we do that with our sort of comparative advantage of being a child rights organization? We're not an environmental organization. How can we contribute then in the best way? Yeah. And wh what would you say, Jon, would, uh, how can Save the Children uh, contribute to the, to the climate around discussion in Sweden? What, what's our role? Oh, I can, we, we, we can contribute uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, Save, Save the Children Sweden is, in, in Sweden, quite a unique organization. We are uh, one of the major popular movements, Folkrörelser. We have about 60,000 individual members and we exist in almost every municipality. At the same time, we, we are the world's largest independent child rights organization and we have partners in, in 119 countries. So when, when we sort of, I think that gives us a, a very special responsibility to make sure that these partners and, and their voices are heard because if we don't do, do our homework, uh, an election campaign is coming, coming up sort of the decisions we are taking also affects our partners in the rest of the world. If we don't do our homework, th the situation of these people will not be present in Swedish debate and, and in the Swedish media. Um, and when I listen to our partners, to our colleagues, to children in, in, in other parts of the world, what strikes me now is how unequal and how unjust the world that is coming out from the pandemic is. And, and, and it's an image that I think is hard to grasp. Uh, we, we as rich countries like Sweden and other rich countries have spent a hundred times more than all the global aid, all the development aid of all the countries to protect our own economies uh, and to protect our own people from the impact of COVID. Whereas in, in a lot of countries, this money just doesn't exist. They have had to go through the pandemic actually cutting down on, on, on health, cutting down on education. Um, and the interesting thing is that if you look at those countries that are most affected by the pandemic are also the countries that are most affected by the climate. 
And the children in these countries that are worst affected by the pandemic are the ones worst affected by climate. And given this sort of world that we're living, that, that we see um, in the Swedish election campaign, for the first time we have uh, some major opposition parties now um, arguing that we should cut down on the, the generous Swedish development aid in a time when we need more international cooperation and more solidarity than ever. Uh, so I do think that's an uh, important uh, role we have to play uh, in the election campaign to really voice the partners and these children in other, in other parts of the world. Mm. And, and Yolanda, I know you have been working on issues regarding the climate, the climate crisis and climate change for a long time, since the 90s. Um, if you go back and see what, how has this discussion developed through the years, uh, if you go back wh from when you started and where we are now, uh, how, like, wh where, where do you think we are now in the discussion? How mature is it? Well, um, I think when I started in the 90s working on the climate crisis, it, was, it wasn't called the climate crisis, it was called climate change. And as I said earlier, there was a lot of talk about we've got to prevent this happening by 2050, by 2100. And it seemed like a long way off. Even then, there was a very strong economic case for taking the measures that needed to be taken. But um, really, action was very, very slow. And there was a huge amount of... Um, misinformation spread and we know now that there was actively lobby groups trying to obscure the issue and say that it was more uncertain than it was. I think the big change now and and certainly the the massive moment this year was the the coming out of this year's IPCC report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change which pulled together the best science from around the world and said unequivocally that climate change is happening, it is affecting every region of the world. This is no longer a question, is it human induced? It's not a question, it is happening, it is getting worse. And it, it has, I think, now finally moved the debate from, is it happening, do we have to worry, into yes, it's happening, and it's happening fast, and it's already visibly happening. Uh, how, how quickly can we move to address this risk? And can we now, st can we scramble? I mean, literally, I think work has to happen on every single possible front to try and achieve the Paris Agreement commitment of 1.5 degrees average warming. And even if we meet that, there will still be some changes. There will still be some people affected. And as you pointed out earlier, um, the people who will be most affected are unfortunately already, those people already living in, in less good conditions, people already in lower and middle income countries, poorer communities, even in the countries where we live, people with less high quality housing, people living on floodplains, people, um, you know, with less access to uh, technologies to support their remote learning from school, uh, people who live in parts of cities that have worst air pollution. So we see, and children in particular, children are very, very vulnerable. They're at a stage of life when they're growing and developing. And so impacts on things like their uh, physical health, loss, you know, poor nutrition can have a lifelong impact. So I think the debate has moved from long term, you know, nice to do one day into right now as urgently as possible. And we need to be reflecting what we're hearing from children that you know, this is not just a, a climate change long term issue. This is a climate emergency. It's a crisis right now. And and often people say, you know, it's impossible to eliminate poverty. Uh, exist yeah. and, and we can make a difference. So we should really be moving into the stage of drastic, urgent action. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just, just something like we have seen that the world has taken dramatic, dramatic measures last year when it came to protecting economies in, in, in the rich world in, um, during the pandemic. So there is obviously, po it's, it's possible to, um, to do that, move swiftly and with, with in high speed, uh, but it doesn't seem to happen on, this cl on the climate crisis. Why, why do you think it's that like that, Jon? Well, I think if the, if, if the children, they, they, they would, would remind us if they would have 
participated there that this is also about justice sort of when we talk about Swedish Sweden development aid for example it's not so much about us giving it is about us having created a strong economy built our wealth uh, through a lot of emissions of, of, of carbon gases contributed then to the situation we are in whereas the children in these countries have, have actually contributed the least because they are children, but also because they live in, in, in countries that don't contribute. So, so it, is, it is a question of justice, and I guess sort of, I don't know if that's part of the answer that, that still in Sweden, we are affected by not nearly as uh, in the same, the same severity as, as children living very far away. And, and these children are very far away, they, they don't, uh, they're not part of our public discussions and so forth. So. Yeah, and you mentioned that in the beginning, Yolan, that there's a lot of, uh, when it comes to drought, for example, a lot of uh, long-term um, uh, complex situation in many countries due to climate uh, change, the climate crisis like drought, for example, that don't make the headlines. Uh, so, so what can, you know, what, what do you think is required to remind the world about these kind of long-term uh, tragedies that's going on, but rarely is making any news. I don't know. It's difficult. The news cycle is a difficult cycle. I think we should try and um, use this moment now where the world is considering how to recover from COVID. It has been a massive crisis for the whole world. We have had some chance to have that solidarity and empathy because we've Everybody in the world has been affected by that crisis, obviously some worse than others, but we have some, I do feel the world has now got some empathy and solidarity mm -hmm. as a result of that crisis. So I would use this moment to try and, and build, build forward a future that we want to see to try and bring into balance economy, equity and environment in, into a better balance. And instead of building back with just a focus on economy to build back with a focus that tries to also consider equity and an environment as well. And I think we should use the well-evidenced approaches that we've seen clicking into action with COVID. So things like social protection systems, like child benefits, we know it's economically sensible. We know investing in children brings a long-term return for our economies. We've seen it work in countries like Sweden, um, and we should be really putting our money where our mouth is in well-evidenced approaches that we know will protect children and, and can be used in many, many more countries in the world and scaling up financing that reaches directly into the pockets of the most vulnerable families. Mm. So uh, it sounds like there's also room for some kind of optimism what's come out of from the pandemic. Do you share that, you? Yeah, and I want to pick up what she said on, on social protection system. Like, Almost all the problems that we have in the world now, part of the answer is strong social protection systems and, and, and preferably universal social protection systems like we have in Sweden, Barn Bidrag. And I do think uh, here that, that this is a conversation where, where we in Sweden have uh, uh, a lot to contribute. And, and I think I would be happy, and, and I know others would, if, if our politicians could sort of step up a bit here and, and, and say, well, it's actually working. Look what, what, what the universal child benefit can do to a society. And uh, it's um, only five minutes left from this, on this talk, but it seems like, Asia, are you on the call now? Yeah, I can hear you. Excellent. And do you also, can we see you? Do you have a video on? Yeah, sure. So, uh, Asia, we have been talking here for a while about the climate crisis, but we all, I think, have agreed that we missed the most important person in this call, and that's actually you. So, we are super happy that you could join. So, uh, I'm going to jump uh, very quickly to you then. Uh, you are one of millions of young activists who have fought for climate justice and put in the climate crisis on the agenda, not only Pakistan, but around the world. Could you just briefly tell us how did you get involved in the movement to begin with? So basically, it all started, uh, well, it's quite a long story, so, so just to cut it really short, 
Um, I'll tell you guys that I was basically a part of a local campaign group which was fighting for climate justice. Since in Pakistan, we don't have that access to um, all the facilities like in other developed countries. So we started to just spread awareness amongst people. And after that, after recognizing our efforts, since I was um, the one who was leading them, so recognizing my efforts, my school coordinator introduced me to Save the Children um, Pakistan team. So after participating in the launch events with them and after collaborating with them, I just got a whole new overview of what the world is working on and what the world is aspiring to achieve. So working, I've been working with them since a year, but I've been working for the climate crisis uh, for about three to four years. So it's been quite a long journey for me locally, but with Save the Children, I've been working for a year. Mm. And when you uh, when you do your activist work, what what kind of work can that be? That work can be spreading awareness amongst people and the local community of Pakistan, which is not aware about the climate crisis. It can be about socially spreading the word to other young activists and collaborating with them in strikes, in tree plantation drives, and in other welfare works which can contribute for good for our society and other article writing projects and other podcasts for example i also participated in a podcast uh with sweden as well mm. and um uh, yeah and the podcast that asia meant if you want to listen uh, uh, hear more about a what asia is talking about and yolanda and others you can find that on spotify and itunes uh, search for save the children documentary and you will find it uh, so we have around two minutes left uh, but could you just give us uh, then uh, um, describe Asia? Uh, it's it's taken a long time for the world leaders and companies to react on this crisis. And uh, why do you think um, it's needed for the world leaders to step up and deliver? What do you want to see? We want basically um, what we want to see is equal grounds for every country to live in equality and you know, a good atmosphere for everyone to survive in because it's their right. Uh, it's their right to live in a well-developed and in a well-organized uh, environment. And by that, I mean that in countries like Pakistan, you don't have that uh, facilities to actually combat the pollution and the atmospheric harm that the climate crisis is doing. So I want what I foresee in the next few years is that all countries working together unanimously for this cause, because it's not just a country to country crisis. It's a global crisis, which is going to affect everyone, not just a single region or a single country. So I'm looking forward that authorities work with children because children are the ones whose voices are underestimated the most in countries in underdeveloped countries and in countries in asian countries basically so what i foresee is the authorities working with children and the authorities working with the organizations which are trying to combat the climate crisis which is basically the first and foremost crisis right now and i foresee a very green future for everyone because I personally believe that it's very much possible and the progress we're going forward with is going to lead us to something very beautiful. Oh, wonderful. That, that's hopeful. It's been quite pessimistic here before, so we're happy that you bring some optimism to, the, to this. Um, and uh, and when, when you talk to the older generation in Pakistan, do they sympathize with the demands that you have? Yeah, they do. But not exactly every time they uh, when I talk, I actually have uh, been talking about this crisis for like quite a long time. And what I have experienced is that 60 percent, if I divide all that, 60 percent of the people would sympathize with that. while 40 percent would not even know about this and regard this as a crisis, which is not worth working for. Okay. So that's what I've experienced within the past few years. Sorry to interrupt you, Aisha. Um, 
we have reached uh, the end of this talk. And, uh, you know, I was super happy that we got you at least the last five minutes. Uh, uh, so a great thank you for, uh, for that, Asia, and happy that you could connect after some difficulties. Okay. And um, thank you, Jon, for coming to this talk. And, of course, Yolande as well. And uh, make sure to uh, check out the podcast if you want to hear more on this issue. Thank you.